Hi, I'm John Appleby. I'm a lecturer in medical ethics at the Medical School at Lancaster University. In this presentation, I'm going to discuss the following question. Should the UK's approach to mitochondrial replacement techniques, also known as MRTs, be adopted in other countries? Here's a brief overview of the main parts of what I want to discuss. There's an awful lot that could be said about whether the UK should be used as a model for other countries looking to use and regulate the use of MRTs. This presentation is particularly targeted at countries that have a desire and the capabilities to consider the use of MRTs. It is important to remember that for some countries, MRTs will not be a medical priority or they will rule out the use of MRTs altogether for, for reasons such as religion. However, for those countries that are willing to entertain the idea of introducing the regulated use of MRTs, in this presentation, I identify a few of the key topics of debate in relation to the approach the UK has taken and give some thoughts on what I think should or shouldn't be adopted elsewhere. I frame these key topics in terms of sub-questions to the overarching question of the presentation. The first question is, should MRTs be used with male sex selection to reduce transgenerational suffering? The second question is, should the scope of eligible patients remain narrow? The third is, should any resulting children be followed up? The fourth is, should other countries adopt a UK model of public engagement and deliberation? Before we start, here's a very brief and UK-centric timeline of some of the events surrounding the regulation of MRTs and the first inhuman use of two mitochondrial replacement techniques pro-nuclear transfer, otherwise known as PNT, and maternal spindle transfer, otherwise known as MST. First, in, two, in February 2015, the UK approved regulations for the use of MRTs. These regulations are called the Human Fertilization and Embryology Regulations 2015, otherwise known as the Mitochondrial Donation Regulations. And they amend the UK's Fertilization and Embryology Act. This regulatory approval for MSTs is significant because it was one of the first pieces of regulation in the world that specifically sought to regulate MRTs. Next, in April 2016, there was the first MRT baby born via MST in Mexico. This is interesting because it happened before the UK HFEA had announced in December 2016 that MRTs were effectively safe for use. By January 2017, the first PNT MRT baby was born in the Ukraine. What's interesting about this is that in this instance, MRTs were used to treat age-related infertility rather than to avoid a mitochondrial disease. By March 2017, the first UK license to use MRTs was granted by the HFEA, and we are now, of course, just waiting for the UK's first UK uh, MRT baby to be born. Now, I begin with the first question of should MRTs be used with male sex selection to reduce transgenerational suffering? The problem is, is that MRTs are an imperfect technology. They almost always involve some level of carryover of mitochondria with harmful mutant mitochondrial DNA during pronuclear and maternal spindle transfer, and this results in genetic mosaicism. Due to the way that mitochondria replicate, genetic bottlenecks can result in low concentrations of harmful mtDNA becoming high concentrations of harmful mtDNA. Mitochondrial DNA is maternally inherited, so I argue that to avoid any MRT child passing on harmful mitochondrial DNA to future generations, it would be best if male sex selection was used alongside MRTs to only select male embryos. I think this should at least be done during the early stages of first in human use of MRTs until we better understand the transgenerational health risks of mutant mitochondrial DNA carryover via MRTs. I have argued this position in detail in the paper cited below. I initially argued for this policy because it helped promote the UK's aim of developing an MRT licensing framework 
that will ensure that any children born have the best chance of a healthy life. However, the UK chose not to pursue the policy of path, the policy path of sex selection because of worries it might threaten the viability of the embryo. However, the US Institute of Medicine's report on mitochondrial replacement did endorse my recommendation and adopted it. Therefore, I think countries should not adopt the UK's approach when it comes to sex selection and should instead adopt a policy that requires sex selection while we are still in the early stages of first in human use of MRTs. There are some objections that are sometimes raised in relation to the type of sex selection recommendation I have made. One objection would be that sex selection negatively affects sex ratios in society. However, this would not apply to MRTs because the numbers would be far too low. The second objection might be that sex selection is a form of sexism. However, again, this would, would not really apply to the case of MRTs because it is being recommended purely on the basis of safety. Third, some might object that this policy could cause suffering to parents. However, this is also implausible because we know from the evidence that does exist on the personal views of MRT, uh, potential MRT users, that they really want to make sure that their offspring do not have to fear having to transmit a mitochondrial disease to their offspring. So this recommendation for sex selection is actually in line with the evidence we have about what the what parents' wishes are as potential users of these techniques. The next question when considering if the UK's approach should be adopted in other countries is, should the scope of eligible patients remain narrow? UK MRT regulations specify that a license can only be granted for use in cases where it has been determined that there is a particular and significant risk that a prospective child will inherit a serious mitochondrial disease. If we agree that any policy recommendations should minimize risk of suffering, then I argue we should aim to restrict the scope of MRT applications initially until further evidence is collected from follow-up on the health of the first children created with these techniques. Mm -hmm. The UK has adopted this very strict eligibility criteria for those who want to use MRTs, and I think it does a good job minimizing the risk of suffering. Therefore, it would make sense for other countries to follow the UK's restrictive policy model in this respect. The next question is, should any resulting children be followed up? Now, the UK didn't seemingly agree to include any follow-up in the licensing conditions for the use of MRTs until quite late in the process of determining what a license would require. But it, did, but it eventually did implement a rule to require follow-up as part of its licensing conditions. The UK requires that plans be in place for clinical follow-up in order for a license for MRTs to be granted by the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. Follow-up is fundamentally important in order to help determine if there are any medical or psychosocial complications or emerging risks in persons conceived via MRT. Therefore, it could be argued that there is an ethical duty to conduct clinical follow-up on MRT-conceived persons for the sake of those persons, but also for the sake of future generations. It would be irresponsible to continue using these techniques without following up on the safety of the offspring created with them. This aspect of UK policy should be used in other countries. Finally, I examine the question of should other countries adopt a UK model of public engagement and deliberation. Perhaps one of the greatest successes associated with the UK's regulated use of MRTs is the process through which the regulations came into existence. Spanning more than four years, the UK Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority and the UK Department of Health conducted consultations with the public and experts on the topic of MRTs. The result was a rigorous and detailed multidisciplinary investigation of the techniques prior to the draft regulations being uh, debated and approved in Parliament. So yes, looking back, there are some areas for improvement. However, it was generally a thorough and considered model of public engagement and deliberation, which other countries would be advised to emulate. 
That sums up my brief response to the question of should the UK's approach to mitochondrial replacement techniques be adopted in other countries? I've provided my thoughts on a few areas of policy that should or shouldn't be adopted as part of a process of mainstreaming MRTs outside of the UK. I'd be keen to hear what you think, and so don't hesitate to get in touch. If you are interested in reading or finding out more about my research and publications that uh, underpin the content of this presentation, please visit my institutional webpage that I've provided the link to at the bottom of this slide. Thank you very much.